You are now listening to Bigfoot and Beyond, featuring the OG bad boys of Bigfoot, the Dr. Heckle and Mr. Jive of Squatchology, the Chip and Dale of Bigfoot, and I'm not talking about the cartoon. Please welcome your hosts, the Bigfoot celebrity couple, Biff Clobo, better known as Cliff Berrickman and James Bobo Fay. Hello, folks. Uh, welcome to another episode of Bigfoot and Beyond with Cliff and Bobo. Oh, this weekend it's just with Bobo. Cliff couldn't make it. And tonight we got a, a guest we've been wanting to have on for a while. So tonight we have Dean Harrison from Australian Yowie Research. A lot of you know who he is. He's, uh, he's the godfather of Yowie Research. The Yowie is the Bigfoot of Australia, basically. And uh, I've known Dean for almost 20 years now. I've, I've met him online, never met in person yet, but we used to be in contact. I hadn't talked to him in quite a while, but I've always followed his uh, webpage, yowiehunters.com. It's definitely one of the best. They got the great follow-up reports. They have auto reports. They interview the witnesses. They put up videos with it. You can go on YouTube and see what they're talking about and see the countryside. It's, it's really great. So, Dean, thanks for joining us tonight from Down Under. Nice speaking with you again, Bobo. Wow, Finding Bigfoot Australia, 2012, is that right? That sounds, yeah, probably 2012, 2013, something like that. That's like nine years ago already. Yeah. All these broken-hearted women you left behind. <laughs> All these little eight-year-old Bobos now running around <laughs> in Australia. Boy Bobos, girl Bobos, big mops of hair. Drooling, stumbling around. <laughs> Talking low and slow. Uh, what was the highlight of your trip when you came out here? Oh, definitely when we were up in um, up by your zone, up above uh, Surfer's Paradise, we had that interaction that night with um, – there's a couple of them there. They're clapping and knocking and doing their thing. You know, we were really surprised how similar it was, to like just having Bigfoots around. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a lot of lot of similarities. I think we may have a few more different uh, species here than you do over in America, but the big ones in general, I mean, they're, they're pretty similar in in descriptions. What people are explaining, what the witnesses are saying, or what we've seen ourselves. Yeah, you guys got the brown jacks done. Those guys. The natives I was with, the aboriginals I was with, were scared to death of those things. Yeah, the, the little ones. Uh, there's a lot of different names for them in the aboriginal dialect, depending on which tribe and where you lived in, in the country. Dinjadi is, is the main name, or you know the adaptation brown jack, as you correctly said. And they're sort of known to be probably the – I think one word that keeps coming up uh, is trickster. They're the, they're the ones that get up to all sorts of uh, pranks and, and do, you know, funny little things, jump on people's roofs and uh, whatnot. Uh, the, the big ones, they don't seem to have that sort of sense of humour. They're, they're sort of more the business end. Right. Yeah, we, um, they took me to a spot. We went, went to a national park behind um, Kira. Up, 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 God, I forgot the name of it. What's that famous, um, where there are the statues and all that? Kilcoy. Yeah, Kilcoy. We were out, I think, north of that. We were, we were at a park anyways, and, and the Aboriginal guys took me out there, and they took me to a spot where they had been attacked by a group of brown jacks. Well, not really attacked viciously, but they kept uh, swinging over their heads, like swinging on vines and stuff and dropping down off branches and stole their sunglasses off their, you know, that they had around their necks or on top of their heads, stole their sunglasses, stole their hats, and were just smacking them on the heads and screaming at them. And these guys were running full tilt down this uh, riverbed and these things are just coming down, swooping them and screaming and cracking them in the heads and not hurting them bad, but just, you know, drove them out of there pretty good. Right. Well, that's that's pretty much along the lines of what I said then. Uh, the, being the practice, getting up to all sorts of high jinx, so to speak, uh, doing all that sort of uh, all that sort of behavior. Uh, I think, you know, if you have a run in with one of these, you know, you might have a couple of tales to tell afterwards. But if you run into one of the big ones on a bad day, you, you might not be around to, to tell that tale. They seem to be more aggressive down there. I mean, I remember talking to you a long time ago. There was that one about the uh, – there was a sniper team out there or something like that. And didn't two of the guys – two of the guys go oh, – they, they survived, but a couple of construction workers went missing off the road that was right near there, the training grounds. Right. Well, that, that was getting back into my, my second, my second uh, encounter, uh, which was – it was life-changing, really. I mean, my first one was back you know, 26 years ago, that long ago. I was just thinking about that this morning. I'm thinking, wow, wow, I have been around for a while. 
Um, also back in the days when you know, John Green, Renee De Hinden, Bobby Short, uh, Art Bell have been on his show, Lloyd Pye, my dear friend, Bill Ribble, the pest from the West, Eric Beckjord, he was still with that. <laughs> my God, do I have some stories about that man. <laughs> but, but don't we all? Yeah. Uh, geez, he, he got up to no good, didn't he? But now, these days we've got like, Joe Bielart, Fran- Franzoni, Henry, my dear friend Henry. Bobby Hamilton, Matt Moneymaker, yourselves. But uh, back then, it was like 26 years ago, and I had one in my backyard, and that was a real eye-opener. It's 11 o'clock at night, and bipedal, which you know rules out most of the native Australian animals, uh, massive vocal capacity, far beyond ours. And we, the koalas, yeah, they, they can make just some pretty savage noises, but not like this. This was different. And it had hands. Uh, it was picking up, uh, well, pulling out foliage from the ground in the swamp behind my house at the time and, and throwing it through through the, the forest. It was displaying emotion and anger and all that sort of thing. So, you know, era 404, file not found, uh, that was no native Australian animal. But Ormo, which is one you were referring to just earlier, uh, that was the really bad one that had caused all sorts of strife around the area and we ended up having to get the SAS guys out there, the military guys, a couple of military guys, because, you know, I knew that it was, it was only by fortune that night that I survived. It was only because I changed my plans at the last minute that I survived. Uh, this thing meant business. There's no question about that. And it had, it had bad, bad intentions. Um, so we ended up sending these guys well i mean there's, there's quite a long story to to get to this point uh, to 2003 i mean it started for me in 1997 when i had my run in with him again about 11 o'clock at night i was going for a jog trying to lose some weight uh, i'd stopped out on the edge of this bush track instead of running down it thank god and i made a phone call instead on the phone, bush to the back, uh, but, but the bush was behind me. Uh, to the front of me was a, a moan uh, paddock, so to speak. It was with uh, high voltage power lines up to a road with a street light. To my left is uh, bush verging around, heading up towards that road. At one stage, just cutting a long story short, I was aware that I was being stalked by something, persons unknown. I was fit, I was boxing at the time, I had no reason to fear anybody in my mind. And uh, I thought I'd let this person get as close to me as they wanted. And I just thought they were listening in on the conversation. So it started off with crashing and smashing, coming through the bush at a distance. And then when this thing had heard me, then it turned into stealth mode. And uh, you could hear a twig every so often cracking underneath the foot, but it was getting closer. And every time it made a noise, it would stop, deliberately stop. So it was a thinker and it would just let the air go by, you know, time passed and then the next step. And then you could hear the foliage slowly being parted and something pushing its way through. And then the next crackle, it would stop again. And uh, so then I was aware that it was right up behind me and out of nowhere, which is so hard to explain, but explained to me regularly uh, from witnesses that we interview, uh, I just got that that nameless dread that comes over you for no apparent reason. This is where you feel like a rabbit in the in spotlight, in the headlights, and you are frozen stiff. You just cannot move. Your body's locked. And at the time, I was trying to rationalise in my mind what was going on, why I was feeling like this, why my body was reacting in such a way. And uh, I knew something was wrong. It was just that sixth sense. You just knew something was not right. So suddenly this person, inverted commas, behind me, is it a person? What is it? And I would uh, I didn't want to make eye contact. For some reason, I just had this knowingness that if I made eye contact direct eye contact, things are going to get exponentially worse. So the best I could do, uh, the best I could do was to turn my head a little bit and turn my eyes just to see this massive silhouette standing there in the bush, probably about eight feet or so tall. I just knew I was I just knew I was in trouble. I knew exactly what it was at that stage. Um, I wasn't into the whole Yowie thing, uh, far from it. But this thing came to me, and so uh, I knew I had to move. So I counted into my head to three. I said, 
one, two, three, move your foot. So I basically had to move my I had to move my shoulders to move my hip, to move my leg, to move my foot. The moment my foot left the ground, roar, came out this thing, roared like a lion, like a lion. And it was very, very similar to the one uh, two years prior uh, when I was living up on the mountain. And all the dogs and all the acreages are all going wild and this thing takes off after me. I was running and anyway, big long chase and this thing was yelling and screaming and it's propelling itself uh, through the trees. So you grasping onto them, you hear the trees and you're smashing through the trees and you hear him jump over the logs and it, when he landed, the diaphragm would bounce and be, oh, oh. on each step would be, a, oh. on top of that would be the, the yelling and screaming. And it was just so angry, emotion, anger. And uh, I mean, it wanted me. The only thing that saved me was that I was on an open field heading up towards a streetlight. And as you and I both know, they won't go out, they won't venture out into that to expose themselves. So he just took the bush line pretty much to my left. And uh, before I knew it, you know, he, I mean, he was running three times my speed through thick dense scrub and I was on a main field not too far away from him and he's running right next to me it was at that point I've gone that's it this is it this is the end of my life it's all over there was nothing I could possibly do to save defend it wouldn't have mattered what sort of weapon handheld weapon other than a gun that that I had it would have been futile against something that was just so powerful and, and I, I basically just given up. This is it. I might as well just throw my hands in the air so they just take me. There was no escape. And then it starts to run ahead of me. And I go, what? What's it doing now? And then I realised he's gone to cut me off. He's getting up ahead so he can get out. And so I've realised this. I've turned to my right. He's lunged out. He, uh, I was far away enough for him to give up. Turn around, walk back to the foliage. I was under the streetlight by this stage. He squats and he's watching me. So... Got that one out of the way. So then we can go on to all the other stories. Well, I won't get into all of them, but it came to a point where this thing was causing so much trouble for so many people, and we believe that he may have taken uh, a worker. Uh, It was in the same month that I was nearly attacked. Uh, This guy went missing, only a stone's throw away, right on dusk, and no one can explain what happened to him. He got dropped off by workmates uh, on the side of this dirt road. Uh, The bush was all very thick back then, and someone was going to come and pick him up, friends, or someone was going to pick him up sometime later. And they turned up. His gear was there, but he was gone, and they never found him since. So then all these other things happened. I don't want to bore you and your your audience with, with the, the rest of the history of this particular bad guy. Um, but it came to the point where the SAS guys, I had to had to bring them in. I had contacts with them because at the time I was trading information with the military. They were running into them during military operations, as I'm sure they would over in your country as well. And uh, so I got in pretty well with these guys and they said, well, what would you like us to do? I said, well, I'd like you to go and have a word with it, so to speak. I really believe that if he hasn't taken anyone's life by now, he will, and you know, for all I know, you know, a lot of the missing people in the area could be contributed to him, and uh, I was nearly one. Um, so they went out there and they set up a, a sniping situation. They had uh, they, they, they played the lone camper. I don't know whether you guys play that over there. You have the, the, the lone camper pretending you're blown in. So, so he, they did that scenario. Now, up above the lone, the lone camper uh, was a sniping position. And these guys had throat mics, they had side arms, long arms, uh, they had rattle traps and um, flashbangs. Then they're all, they were like, they're triggered by um, trip wires. Uh, first night, nothing to report. Second night, I think it began at about nine o'clock, they were hearing some noises down in the valley. And uh, it escalated by 11 o'clock. And in the night vision, uh, the sniping guy, radios down below and says, hey, I've got something here. He's seen you, he's moving towards you. And uh, I think that was at, I don't know, it was, it was about 100 yards or so. And when it got to about the 60-yard mark, the guy below, he was getting really nervous. And uh, he said, well, I want you to do something about this. But this, And he says, it's okay, he's coming right up to the flashbang now. So as he goes up to the flashbang, this is pitch darkness, treed canopy, no light, 
and a black thin wire. This thing goes right up beside the tree and what does it do? It looks down and sees the wire. My, my military contact said that is impossible, physically impossible. You cannot see that in that sort of light. You, you'd be struggling to see that during the day, he said. He said, but it stopped. It looked down and it examined the wire and then walked around the other side of the tree. Uh, and then as it's getting up close, the guy below said, no, nah, enough's enough. Go, go, go. So this guy's opened up with one one round and it just misses his left shoulder. It impacts the tree beside him and this thing roars. It turns around and it runs straight through the flashbang, lights up the whole area, which shut the night vision down, of course, and uh, they're, they're blind and he's run back down, but he's stopped and he's come back round again. And this said that these guys both said he was relentless. He just kept going at it. So they ended up emptying the entire magazine with a long arm at him. And this thing rushed down into the valley and they chased him with the sidearms. And uh, I got the full report. Uh, one week later, a colleague of mine, Nigel Francis, he went to the area unbeknown that this has gone on because all this was top secret at the time. I wasn't allowed to tell anybody about any of this. And uh, he'd, he knew of the area because I had told him about you know, previous experience. So he'd gone there for, for himself. And he phones me from location and said, do you know anything that has happened here in the last you know, few days? And I had to keep quiet. I, I couldn't say anything. I said, why? He said, because there's bullet holes in the trees and he said the whole area has been raked, it's been sanitised. And that's exactly what was written in my report, how they sanitised the area before they left. So that was my confirmation. Stay tuned for more Bigfoot and Beyond with Cliff and Bobo. We'll be right back after these messages. Well, yeah, I actually saw your spot where you had your, uh, your encounter in 1997, the one where you were running. My buddy, when I was up there, took me. He goes, "This is where Dean had his spot." And he took me right to that. I saw the street light and everything, and, and the, that's where the SAS guys. And for those listening at home, SAS is basically like your guys' is Navy SEALs or Green Berets. That's correct. Yeah, and that, that was that was that was near that spot, huh? That's where the, the SAS set up. That's right. Yes. So I, I wasn't aware that you actually went to the location. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were going to meet up with you, and then um, we ended up switching our whole filming schedule around. Ended up going up to. Uh, Fingal and up in that old zone. We were, originally we started off down south, but we were meeting up with Rex Gilroy, but he was in pretty bad shape. Yeah, that's that's interesting that you had all that stuff go on down there, and that's what got you into it. But you guys, um, this year you guys had that thermal video that was just awesome. I mean, I posted that, and I was commenting with people on my page, and they got a lot of good feedback. I mean, I think you guys, that's probably the best thermal clip I've ever gotten. Yeah, well, I tell you, Bobo, it is an absolute game changer having this new technology. Uh, you know, back in the day, as you know, you hear a noise, and, and this is like if you consider yourself a researcher, as many of these people do, a lot of these kids, they all go out into the bush. And uh, if you're in that situation with that mindset that you're a researcher and you're going out for the specific reason to look for Bigfoot and have an encounter, there's a pretty good chance you're mind will be clouded or your reality will be clouded and uh, every noise you hear you'll attribute to a Bigfoot, as you know. So, But you now this just takes the, uh, all, all the guesswork out of, out of each noise that you hear. Uh, nothing can hide really from a thermal camera. Um, you can be behind a lot of thick foliage, it'll still pick you up or you could be in a tent for, the, for that matter and you could, it'll still see you. Um, so this was just, was just, I mean, we've we've had a lot of success over the last nine months with these cameras, but that that was the kicker. That was absolutely amazing. Which which models your new one? I saw you guys had like an old Scout. Well, originally I had a Fleur. It was a H series Fleur, and in Australian dollars, that cost me nearly ten grand. Um, and that that's back when our dollar was pretty much parity, the same. Uh, the same dollars and cents. Uh, these, this is a new model. Uh, it's out of China, which most things are these days. It's, it's a guide. So that's the brand name is a guide. It's, it's a guide IR50. And in Australian dollars, you're looking at uh, about three and a half grand each. And I, I bought five. Um, and yeah, so the backstory of this was 
Springbrook, it's on the, the, the Gold Coast hinterland and it's renowned for Yowie activity, Yowie sightings. And the first uh, reports came out in the 70s in the, in the newspapers. And since then, it's really, really escalated. Uh, so I'd spent a lot of time there since the late 90s. And you get to recognise a lot of the the different signs. And we believe, you know, there are different clans. They have different signs in different areas, different things, little, little, little things that they do. And this particular group, they use sticks and they'll do symbols, all types of symbols, whether the symbol be um, a cheapie or you know, something up against a tree, the X markers, you know, all the, all the usuals. But they'll also do... They'll do symbols on the ground, so you might find a, a stick broken into a triangle. You might have broken into different other so, sorts of shapes and or crossed over each other and you know, all, all this sort of thing. So you get to know what to look for in certain areas and being active in this area myself for so long, I, I'm a bit of an expert. And this one particular day we'd, we'd hiked up the hill, uh, it's myself and Gary Lynn and um, Jacob Fellows, and we'd gone up this really steep incline, it was unhospitable. It's almost like climbing a ladder for about two hours to get to the top of this mountain. And the moment we got to the top, we found a track, which was totally unexpected. And within seconds, here were the signs. Uh, we worked, walked further, and there was more, we worked for, and there were more and more, and they were basically screaming out, we are here. That's what they were saying, we are here. Yeah, I saw that you guys had a bunch of you found those little sticks stuck in the ground. You know, um, what I, I just always assumed they only do that when the ground's real muddy. They just stick it in when it's wet and then let it dry like that. The, the climate here varies. The I mean, you can walk a hundred yards on one of the tracks in Springbrook. This is national forest. It's rainforest in areas. It's Australiana type gum tree in, in, in others. But you can walk a hundred yards, and you can go from muddy to medium to completely dry, and then back again. It's that sort of terrain. And you know, it didn't matter how hard, and some of our guys are pretty big. Gary Lynn's a big man. And if he tries to spear one of these into the ground using all his force and he can't do it, then, you know, that says something. It did, well, what it says basically is it didn't fall from a tree and do it itself. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, that does happen, yes, but this is different. This is different. And they're all situated in a way, a position that, it was peculiar. Um, so with that, I've said they are here. They're saying they're here. We need. This is where we need to be. We need to be here now. So we had to find another way in because it's not like we've got to haul all our gear all the way up that mountain uh, like we did. I mean, that was that was soul destroying getting up that mountain. So you can imagine, you know, a couple hundred pounds worth of equipment. Um, so we, we ended up finding another way on another day. About two days later, we, we returned. We found another way in. And then that weekend, we set up Buckingham. Uh, he had never used one of the new thermals before and it was about 11 o'clock at night and there was one sitting on our on our table we had our camp set up we had hammocks and we had to have hammocks because of the leeches the leeches were everywhere wherever you look there was leeches there was leeches and there's ticks and all sorts of things so we had to get off the ground um <laughs> there was literally a swarm of leeches it was incredible uh so Buckingham had picked up one of the thermals. He got a, a quick lesson from Gary Lynn, and he said, I'm just going to walk off and have a play. So off he went. He probably went about 100 yards, maybe 150 yards away. Uh, it's pitch darkness. Again, treed canopy, uh, mountainous terrain. And I think about 20 minutes later, we get a radio feed. We're all wearing uh, ear mics because we've got radio silence. We don't use white light out there either, Bobo. We just think that's wrong. We use red light because it doesn't carry through the bush and it's not um, it's not impacting and it's not intimidating. So we had red, red head torches. Uh, we had ear, ear mics and Buck radio back and said, hey, I've got something here and it's looking at me. Um, now, me being around for a long time, you get a little bit sceptical. You, know, you, you hear a lot of things and a lot of people say, you know, oh, I've got something in the ears. <laughs> Yeah, okay, I'll believe it when I see it. Then we, then we didn't hear anything for you know, another 20 minutes and then Buck radios back again and says, I have two of them in front of me right now. And Gary got on 
the radio and said, would you like some backup? Do you want me to come over? And Buck said, yes, please. So Gary heads off, uh, all lights off, of course, and he's making his way through the dark closer and closer to Buck. And Buck's obviously also in total darkness, stealth. And as Buck is getting Uh, Sorry, as uh, Gary is getting closer to Buck, these two look up, they see him, and they turn and they leave. Now, when when they got back to camp, Buck told us the entire story, and Gary threw it over onto his iPhone so we could watch it. I mean, this this is how good these these cameras are. You can just Wi-Fi it straight over to it, like a, a larger screen so everyone can watch. And I was staggered, absolutely amazed at this footage. I mean, you know, it took a long time to get there, but we got there. Here's the footage. Here it is. And, yes, yeah, absolutely. The fascinating thing is that, I mean, Buck was reasonably close, but he said they made no noise as they entered and they made no noise as they left. And this is pretty dry foliage underneath. All the times I've got glimpses, I never heard them first. It was always like, surprise like oh there you know there, oh there it is i never you know like heard something then looked and there it was it was always just i looked up and there it was yeah well you've seen the footage and you know, the people who listen to your program or maybe they'll go and have a look as well we have it on our, our home page so if you go to the yowiehunters.com home page uh, we've got a few videos there me talking in a couple of interviews but the one at the very top uh, is the footage where we go back and we analyze it all and figure out how tall it is etc um, and and some of the some of the images that Buck got that night. I mean, okay, there was the two. I mean, there was the two. There's there's the two. There's the way one walks out, and these things are like eight nine feet tall, right? And built huge things. The, the first one, he walks out, he bends over, and he puts his long arm out, really long arm. It stretches all the way out as he's bent over, and he picks something up. Now the one behind him. He's watching his back. Now, at this stage, I'm playing classical music on a speaker at base camp. So the one that's that's reached out, they both come out from behind a tree. The one that's reached out, he's facing base camp. But the other one behind him, He's got his, they've got their backs to each other. The other one's watching his back while he's bending over, picking things up. So they had to have known humans were in the area because of the noise we were deliberately making. Um, so he's picked something up and he turns around and he hands it over the shoulder of the one behind him. Now, you can't see the hand of the one behind him taking whatever it was, but then he turns around and he goes down again and he picks something else up. And he turns around. And, and Buck, because he's never used this camera before and, you know, he's devastated to this day that he had he was going through all these settings trying to zoom in and out, but that's not how the camera works. So he's going to all different ca- colour settings and things. Um, but not only that, he got footage of uh, one hugging a tree and you can see that it's got an arm around the tree. And this is what they do, particularly during the daytime. They'll pretend to be a tree. Um, they'll blend. That's how they blend. So they'll put both arms around a tree, pretending they're a part of a tree, uh, or they'll have one arm around a tree, another hand out being a branch. And this is this is stuff that's being reported to us all the time. Um, and even totally autonomous, standing out in a forest with both arms out. Um, so we had some of that there, but then there was just, just some really spooky stuff there as well. That first image you're talking about, it looked like it had eye, two eyes on it, that one? That's the one, yeah. That I mean, yeah, that's what I said. Uh, this is why uh, natives of most countries say you don't walk the bush alone at night. Yeah, that's, yeah, I, I can sympathize, though, with uh, Buck messing up, you know, like hitting the wrong button when you're like, oh, my God, there it is, you know, and you're trying to zoom in or zoom out, and you're hitting color palette. I mean, it's, it's understandable, especially if you're, not, if you're new to it. Yeah, and this was a this this one that we're referring to. It was like a cloaked thing with these these two big guys. Interestingly, about two weeks later, same location. Uh, all the dynamics of this location have totally changed. By the way, no sticks, no sides. Oh, haven't got back to my other point yet. Um, two weeks later, everything had changed, and it was midnight ish. Uh, we walked from base down to this area that we call the crossroads, it's just a dirt track. Uh, as we got to the uh, crossroads, myself and Gary Lynn 
decided we'd walk back to base and grab a couple of fold-up stools, just like little camping things. And so we'd walked off and we're about three quarters of the way back and it's in a straight line, line, line of sight, and Buck was watching us on the thermal. I was in front of Gary so he couldn't see me. All he could see was Gary. And uh, and suddenly we get a, a radio feed saying, has one of you walked into the bush? Negative. Are you sure neither of you have walked into the forest? Negative. Did you follow the path all the way back to base? Yes, we did. We're both here now. You sure you didn't? No, we didn't. So what had happened is as we we're walking and getting closer to base, from the left of us, behind us, something has walked out across the track bipedally and into the bush on the other side. Now, we didn't hear this happening behind us. Buck is absolutely 100% and still talking about it, you know, two months later, that he's kicking himself, that he didn't hit the record button. Uh, he was just complacent because, I mean, he didn't think anything was going to happen. He was just simply watching us. But out comes this thing and the description of it, exactly the same as that freaky thing in the start of our video. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to just quickly go uh, back onto regarding the footage is the next morning after we'd, uh, Buck had taken this footage, I think we went to bed about 2 or 3. We got up at you know, 5.30. We'd, we'd left by 6 as we were leaving. So there's a window of probably about three hours or so, I don't know, so, something in that vicinity where from where Buck was standing to, to the time we got up. We got up and here's all these markers across the track where we were, where he had taken that footage. And we'd walked it. They were not there before. There was an X marker. There's some crazy-looking Egyptian thing. There's a big stick right in the, in, in the centre. There's, oh, it was, you, you saw the footage. Well, they've documented chimpanzees in Africa. They'll use sticks over the crosses and, like, deltas and, like, the top laying stick will indicate like which direction they went and the other stick will be like which direction they came from. Like they've kind of deciphered what the meanings are. You know, it's, it's real rudimentary. It's not like they're not writing novels with it, but they can, I forget how many different uh, directions they could identify or what, they, like if it meant there was no food this way or there was food this way. They came from that way and there was food. And have you guys talked to any chimpanzee experts to see what they think about those stick structures? No, but uh, that's really interesting that you say that, and I'll definitely be looking into that. That's fascinating. As you say, rudimentary, and that's what you'd expect, right? Yeah. We see that here, and a lot of people are not convinced, you know, that that's, they're related to Sasquatch, or in your case, Yowie, but I have no doubt in my mind that they're responsible for them. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, a lot of it doesn't make sense. It shouldn't be there, and particularly in areas where you just don't find humans, and heck, why would they do it anyway? Right, exactly, yeah. I mean, we're, we're, all, we're all questioning what they mean. And if we can break that code and you know, let's, let's have a look at what the, these experts about the, the, the chimpanzees say, I, I'd like to see some of that. Yeah, yeah. It'd be interesting to see any, com, any uh, comparisons that line up. Uh, so you guys, how, um, we get a lot of scientists interested in the Sasquatch phenomenon in North America. What It seems like there's less academic acceptance down there with the Yowie, with the scientists and anthropologists down there is that the case yeah it's a taboo subject they're all too scared uh, we had one academic one scientist a professor uh, who's uh, sadly passed away now a good friend of mine uh, helmet lifts Wissauer, a german background and he spent a lot of time researching this and he wasn't backwards and coming forwards he did not care less but I, I deal with one academic at the moment. He's into the anthropology, paleontology, uh, all that. He's very good, but he says, I cannot talk to my peers about this, he said, because uh, that would pretty much be the end of my career. Um, and that was a life-changing experience for him when he had his. Now, it wasn't that long ago. It was 2017, and he was doing surveying work on the border of New South Wales and Queensland, and uh, he'd gone up, he, well, he said, I, I go to areas that most people don't tread because of the surveying work. And, and he'll do government studies for ancient Aboriginal sites, etc., uh, and get the legislation passed through Parliament uh, to, like, for, to protect the area, etc. And so he'd, he'd gone up through these cascades, he was at the top of these, these ranges, 
And he looks to his right, and here is this Yowie Bigfoot squatted down looking directly forward, and he said it was like a statue. Wasn't moving, wasn't blinking. He was just staring like, I am not here, I am not here. Uh, And he said, I had camera in my backpack. He said, I had my phone in my back pocket. Do you think I was thinking at that point, hey, let's take a photo? He said, you'd think, you know, someone, you know, from from my background, you would. But uh, uh, no. He said, that's the last thing. He said, now, I wanted to appease this thing, say, you don't want to be seen? Guess what? I can't see you either. You don't see me, I don't see you. And so he said, just very, very carefully, he turned and he walked and he walked very carefully. And when he got out of sight, he hightailed it. He said, I mean, it really did affect everything, as it does many of our witnesses. Like I say, it's a life-changing um, encounter for, for most most people. They don't view the bush, the forest, the same way again after having, uh, well, after knowing that the one of these, well, they, they, they live out there. Um, but he said, this, this thing, he said, I knew exactly what it was. He said, this should have been here 250,000 years ago, not in 2017. So, uh, so he's he's uh, he's moved forward with his his own research into it now, but that's between us and him. He won't tell his peers about what he's really do- what what he is doing. Yeah, I was surprised when, when we were in Austria. We were shocked because we were filming down there, and some people rec- we got recognized a little bit. You know, some people watched the show and not, but um, they were like, "What are you guys doing here?" We're like, "We're here for the yeah." Like, what? We don't have any big for thing. We're like. You know what Bigfoot is, but you don't know what a Yowie is. Like, how, and like everyone always said, Are you here for Yowie the candy? And I'm like, No, Yowie, like the relic hominid, you know, the big Bigfoot type thing. They're like, We don't, I've never heard of that. And like, it was less than 10% of people we encountered ever even heard of a Yowie. Yeah, it'd be nice to have a Jeff Meldrum here. Yeah. Yeah, we're really lucky to have Jeff. And there's a lot more academics than that involved. I mean, there's a ton under the, under the you know, keep it under the covers, but. I mean, his relic hominid inquiry out of Idaho State University, it's a peer-reviewed, you know, scientific journal. And they've got 24 PhDs, you know, that are publicly involved with it, you know. So it's it's not a great thing on your resume, but it's not a career killer like it would be down in Australia. Well, it's because of the numbers. I think that's what it comes down to. I mean, we, we don't have a plethora of, you know, scientists, et cetera, that you do over there. Um, so it's, everything they do over here is, is pretty guarded. Um, we, we sent a, well, I sent a, a cast to Jeff Meldrum and Jimmy Chilcutt um, back in the year 2000 for a documentary that they examined, and that was taken in the same area uh, where we got the footage a few months ago. Okay. And how far is that place you got the footage from the Piper video? <laughs> the Piper video. Jesus, that's a funny story. Um, that's down near Canberra, which is um, probably about 3,000 kilometres away. Uh, yeah, a, a long way down down below Sydney. But uh, the story to that was that this individual, his name was Steve Piper. He, he was a limousine driver at the time. I think it was yeah two thousand from memory. Uh, he had taken this footage in the Brindabella Ranges, um, which is part of the Snowy Mountains near Canberra. And he teamed up with a guy called Tim the Yowie Man. And uh, so they thought they'd make a lot of money out of this. Um, so they, they had sold it to a local TV station. And then the rival TV station got in contact with me and said, what do you think? Come into our studio. So I did a show on it. And they wanted to sue that channel and da 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 uh, Anyway, looking at the footage straight away, you can tell there's something wrong. Um, when it's in the clear, he zooms out. When it goes by the tree, he zooms in. Back in the clear, he zooms back out again. It's got a pretty corny-looking limp. It kind of looks like a suit. And uh, it was it was a hoax, we believe. And the, the, the funny thing is that years later, that this guy, Steve Piper, when questioned about it, says he has no recollection of the footage at all. Uh, he got into some sort of fight, he claims, he was knocked out, and since that day he doesn't remember the footage. That's very convenient, isn't it? I thought it was, I didn't think it was real, but 
Daniel Perez got rich the Bigfoot Times newsletter. He looked into it when he was down there for the Olympics in 2000. And he was, yes, yeah. yeah. He thought he thought it looked good, so I was like, huh, well, he, that made me think about it differently. But hearing you say you definitely think it's a hoax, and that's I'm pretty firmly down on that. Oh, yeah, there's, there's no question. There's absolutely no question it was a hoax. I mean, Danny, Danny Perez went out to the location at the time, and uh, they researched it, et cetera. But people like myself, uh, Tony Healy, Paul Cropper, uh, we're all very tight, and you know, knowing Tim the Yowie Man at the time, what he was like, and uh, and the reputation of this Steve Piper character, uh, we just knew it was a hoax. And and then yeah, later, no recollection. Fancy that. Yeah, yeah. Cliff and I met Tony Healy in Bluff Creek in like two thousand six. Yeah, Tony was telling you about that the other night. Actually, he gave me a whole heap of stories. Oh, and I wrote them down too. And then where I put them. Yeah, he had a lot of recollections about, about meeting you out there. Yeah, he's a cool guy. Their book is great, too. I love their book. Yeah, well, the trilogy number three is sitting there pretty much 99% written, but they're just dragging their feet a little bit. I think Paul is a little bit. I, I had my alliance with Paul Cropper and Tony Healy, Gary O, but uh, back in 1998, so, I mean, that's a long-term relationship, too, when AYR was founded back in those days, we all dug up uh, for our database uh, information dating back to the first fleet, I mean, the, the first white settlers in this country back in the early 1800s. So our database is great, but you know, thank, well, a lot of thanks has to be given to Tony and Paul. Yeah. Um, I think if I remember, 1879, I think it was the first Yahoo report the Botany Bay. What'd you think of that? Re- what'd you think of that story? More than likely a hoax. That's what I thought. Yeah. Well, the, the the early reports really began in the media around about the uh, 1820s or 1820 itself, uh, and then but by the time by uh, 1850, it was so widely reported in every state, and these are back in the days where. You didn't have internet. You had no communication. There's no phones. There's nobody knew each other, and everyone lived in remote areas. So there's no collaboration. But everyone was coming up with the same stories, uh, the same description, and it was so prevalent that in the in the mid 1800s that they thought we may have our own indigenous primate. Um, so those those headlines saying. Uh, is this Australia's version of the uh, the African um, gorilla? And you know, have they have they escaped confinement, or were they already here? You know these sorts of headlines. Uh, another one, you know, supposed gorilla or another gorilla. Um, so yeah, it was it was very very prevalent uh, by the 1800s. So and then it just escalated from there. Stay tuned for more Bigfoot and Beyond with Cliff and Bobo. We'll be right back after these messages. Yeah, it just blows my mind that it's still, it's still a mystery that this, this, you know, 200 years later, it's still like up in the air. I can't, it's just mind blowing when you see them, how big they are and, and like they're, they're real or a physical being. It's like, how can they still not be categorized? Well, that's all, that, that, that's the question on everyone's lips, and you know, and, and then you know, the, the the typical question you get is why why no body? Well, I've got an answer to that, and it's quite simple. Where you find one, there's another not too far away, as we saw in the footage. And prior to this footage, on that same night, in fact, I was saying to the guys, where you find one. There's another not too far away. And and, and then the footage. Uh, but the thing is that if one dies of natural causes, it's not going to be left there. You're just not going to kick some dirt and leaves over Uncle Billy and go, oh, well, that's a shame, and walk away, you know, to be picked apart by predators and found by humans. Uh, you'd take care of your dead. Now, hundreds of thousands of years ago, they were burying their dead. What makes it any different these days? Oh, I'm 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 100% convinced. I actually, I've been planning on for like 17 years with going with these Athabascan Indians up in the Yukon of Alaska. There's a Bigfoot graveyard reported up there. Uh, there's a cave right next to it, and I guess there's tons of just bones like caribou and 
deer and moose bones, just hundreds and hundreds of them piled up around there. And they found a uh, four gra- four graves. They thought of a of Bigfoot's there, like you know, nine foot long by five foot wide, um, big mounds on top, mounded up piles of dirt with the, whatever rock they had around there. And they're they're going in September, but I can't go. But yeah, I mean, there's there's so many stories of them taking their dead, covering them up. They put them all the natives up here, so they put them in caves and then you know put big rocks that no human could move, and they put them where no machinery can get. So there's just unless you brought up there and brought a bunch of dynamite and blew up in the hole, you just would never even. You know, there's no way to get to them, and they put them in places where there's no one going anyways. Yeah, well, I believe they, they do have a, a family structure. They have their clans. Um, there's probably opposing clans or probably the grants, and you don't go to my area, I don't go in yours. Uh, another thing I believe is that they're not as nomadic as what a lot of people think. I think home is always home. Yes, they may wander, but they'll always be back. Right. That's the same. Yeah, we're on the same page up here. That's what we think, too, like, and they might travel around somewhat. We had cases, uh, well, up here, for instance, there was a family of three. I live in Northern California on the coast, up just uh, by Bluff Creek, actually. And there was a family group of three Bigfoots, a male, a female, and a young one uh, that were seen around this dump up in Klamath, on the Klamath River mouth up there. And for like two years, the locals were seen in the, the high school kids would go there and drink and party, and these things would come chase them away, and then they'd throw beer bottles at them and drive off. This whole thing that was going on, they disappeared from here. Then they showed up around by Mount Shasta. There was three of them, three white ones seen. And then they were seen in the Sierra Nevadas, which is you know a couple hundred miles east of here. And then they were seen 400 miles south on the Sierra Nevadas. Then they were seen, uh, they cr- went down by L.A. and then crossed in Southern California. They must have crossed into the coast range, went all the way back up towards Santa Cruz, San Francisco area. And over the course of like a year, there was three Bigfoot seen you know, all the way around, you know, uh, California that had walked over a thousand miles. If that was the same three, we, we can't prove it's the same three, but it was pretty interesting. Then they just they got up to a uh, Big Sur, Santa Cruz area, and there's no reports from them ever since. Well, yeah. Well, another thing uh, along the point of you know family units, etc., was the night that I was hit. Now. This is an area that we had a lot of experience with these creatures going back to, well, use the word creature, I don't know, it's probably a better term than that, Um, back to the probably 1998 in Queensland, not too far away from where you went on the Sunshine Coast up here in Queensland. And uh, we've had a lot of interaction. Uh, I've got so many stories uh, about our encounters there, even with a, a New York journalist team that came out with this one night. But uh, on this particular night, and again, I mean, you, you have your highlights, and this is definitely, of course, one of mine. And uh, it was January 2, 2009. You know, this wasn't like a real expedition type night, it was more of a, a meet and greet of certain people. There was only a handful of us. And uh, we'd set up camp right where uh, we'd had past experience. Uh, in past years, we knew they were there, but yeah, it was just more more of just a night out camping, if, uh, other than anything else. Uh, we were quite loud. We were raucous, um, not concentrating on anything in particular. Then it came to I think just after midnight, and I think a couple of people started to dare others to walk up this particular track in, at night uh, during the night. It was a valley. Had a rocky cascade that was going, uh, that was ascending up. Um, there was a track that had an escarpment up to the left, and is heavily, heavily treed pine forest. Uh, heavy, heavy uh, cloud cover, so it was very hard to see the hand in front of your face. And, and what I normally do, as you probably do, and others. If you're in a, a base camp situation or any any sort of you know, setup situation, be it lone camp or play or, or whatever, you go and situate yourself away and have a listen to hear if you have any visitors. Uh, that you know, quite often they'll they'll come for for a look out of curiosity. And you know, this is pre thermal camera days. So I decided I'll go for a walk. So I went down into this valley, not too far away from base, and went up this uh, granite cascade and I began to smell this really pungent odour. It was sulfuric 
you know, I know and others know that this is commonly associated with you know, Biawi Bigfoot sightings, a sulfuric-type rotten egg-type smell. So I'd radio this back down to base, and Steve, who's the local policeman there, he, uh, he said, careful, you know what that could mean. And you know, I was complacent, and I keep walking, and I sat up on top of this rocky cascade. I had my mag light, a bottle of water, and a radio. And I sat there, and I was just tuning into the bush around me, just listening, absorbing it all. Then within, I'd say, almost seconds, like 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, there's this noise marching above me. This thing was walking bipedally, no question, two feet, walking like a person but with purpose, not trying to cover the sound of the footsteps, not interested with purpose. And so I've stood up. Everything down, everything's still down beside me. And I, 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 I'd, I'd leant over and I picked up my radio and said, head count guys, where are you all? And they said, no, we're all here. I said, well, I've got company. And as soon as I said that, this thing turns and starts running down this mountainside in pitch darkness. Now, it's running. It's sprinting. Now, if you and I were in this darkness going down a hill, with all this foliage and you know, stumps and you know, fallen bracken and this and that, we'd be tripping over walking. This thing was sprinting all the way down. And as I say, I wrote the book on their behaviour, but this guy didn't read the book. <laughs> he didn't behave according to my, to, to, to my knowledge. And, and after, he had to stop. He had to stop. You've got to stop. Please stop. And... He's all he's, he's 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 closing on me, and he's getting faster and faster. And now I know he's so close to me. Even if he wanted to stop, I don't think he could stop. And so I've got my hand up in the air. I'm yelling, "Stop! Stop! Stop!" And yeah, I know, like he could understand me. And now this is the point: like you can pre-plan all these fantasies out in your mind till the cows come home. You can have every possibility worked out in your head. If this happened, I would do that. If that happened, hey, I would do this. You're on top of it all. But guess what? When it happens, uh -uh, it's all out the window. I didn't even think of bending over and picking up my mag light, for God's sake. You know, everything was out the window. Uh, And before I knew it, this thing was on top of me. He'd hit me straight in the chest. And I don't know whether it was a palm, whether it was a forearm. Uh, I went backwards. I lost my feet, went through the air, and I landed in a pool of water. And needless to say, I was beside myself. You'd like to think that in situations like this, in your mind when you're playing out all these roles, if this ever happens, hey, I'm on top of it, uh, you'd like to think you're a bit of a hero. And No, I wasn't, sadly to say. I was beside myself. Uh, I was so scared. Uh, I was waiting to be picked up and flung into a tree, this thing standing over the top of me, and I'm rocking from side to side, kicking my legs in the air, trying to keep this thing away from me. I'm doing these futile punches in the air. I'm doing everything I can, and at the same time I'm yelling at base camp, yelling at them for help. He was there, and he had not finished with me. I know that for sure. And if it wasn't for the guys getting to me on time, again, I'd be just another missing person. The guys get to me. um, This thing stepped off me. He's walked on the other side of this, this big tree, and he's gone into the forest. We're following him. And as he's looking at us in pitch darkness, the eyes were illuminating. Now, when I say they're illuminating, I mean self-illuminating not reflecting, they were self-illuminating in pitch darkness. Heavy foliage cover, no cloud, no moon, no stars, in a valley, they were self-illuminating. They were a a dull white-grey colour, which you don't hear that often. Uh, Normally it's all the usuals, the red, etc. But this is what, this is the colour this one had. And it was blinking as it's looking at us. Now, as we walk forward, it will all go black because he's turned his head away from us looking forward and he would keep the same distance from us. When we stop, it would stop. He would then turn around and look back at us and then the eyes were back, blink, blink, blink. So we played this game for a while. 
called it a night at, I don't know what time, three or four, at about eight o'clock in the morning, and this is the interesting part. Well, not this is the interesting part. That was the interesting part. Well, this is another interesting part. Um, I'd gone for a hike by myself, stupidly, as I do, because I'm pretty stupid, and I had – there's no phone reception there, so I didn't have my phone or anything. And I was heavily dehydrated as I'm coming back. There's only one track back to base camp. And I needed to get back there because I needed water pronto. As I'm coming down this hill on this track, uh, getting closer to base camp, I see ahead of me on the left-hand side in the long grass, there's this long probably uh, three, three three-and-a-half-foot grass, uh, spindly, yellowy grass, uh, thick, there's one sitting down there. Whether it be sitting on the knees or sitting on its bottom, I don't know. But as I'm getting a little bit closer and my mind's digesting this, it leans forward into the grass and now I can't see it. Now, from that time, the moment I saw it, I had the feeling female. I always say I don't know. I don't know why. I have no proof. I have no facts. But I just got the feeling that was a female. So, again, I had no choice. I had to get around this. And I'd stopped there for quite a few minutes because I didn't want to go any further. I didn't want to have to walk past it. I mean, it was a pretty scary thing considering what happened the night prior. But but I had to get past it. I had to. I had no choice. I was dehydrated. I needed water. Uh, So baby steps, baby steps. As I'm getting down close, being quiet, baby steps, baby steps, And as I get equal, I still can't see her. I'll call her her. Whack, 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 right beside me to my right on the other side of the track. Here's the big male. This is the guy that hit me the night prior. Could you imagine what I went through at that particular time? Oh, my God. So I've I've went over and I've picked up a rock, had that in my hand. I don't know why. It It just felt good having something in my hand. And... Um, and so I'm doing baby steps, baby steps, don't look behind, don't look behind, don't look behind, and just, just keep going until I got out of sight and then just rush back to base camp. But so anyway, it took me – I had uh, about eight months of PTSD after this event um, of the previous night, then the next morning, eight months, eight months where I had a really hard time getting to sleep at night. Uh, I, could, I couldn't get a full night's sleep. Things just kept rocking and rolling in my mind, and the biggest question – that kept me awake was why the question why why did it hit me what did I do that compelled it to to run down and hit me without a care in the world without with no no stealth not being careful it was it rushed at me like it was um, on with a purpose as I said before and I couldn't work it out and so you know tossing and turning it wasn't until a while later when I really thought about it. And this is where it comes back to my initial point. Where there's one, there's another not too far away. When I walked up that granite cascade and that smell that I could smell, I think that was her. I think she was close to base. And so he's run down and clocked me. Okay. Do you think that females and males have different smell? Wouldn't have a clue. But I do know, after talking to uh, an academic friend of mine, that male gorillas can give off an odour. Uh, some of it uh, we can't pick up on, but they can. Now, as he correctly says, we don't know anything about the composition, the makeup of these, of, of this species. We don't know what they can let off. Now, is it at will? Um, is, is it an aggression thing? Is it deliberate or is it just, hey, they smell? We don't, we don't know. Um, but he seems to think it's only the males. But you now he said that we don't know the species. Maybe the females can let off this sort of smell and maybe I was getting close to her and she's let off this defensive smell and uh, he was there he was watching he wasn't too far away and he's come down and he's defended the woman like a heroic big foot he is and uh yeah yeah and that had to be intense to get run over by one of those things we don't we don't hear too many stories about them making physical contact with them up here you know like if they're really determined to take you out I think there's not much you're going to do like so you don't hear like a lot of stories about people getting beat up and then getting away. I think if, if they if they're going to get you, they're going to get you. I don't think it happens that often, not up here, anyways. But yeah, but the thing is that if I was by myself, it would have been a very different outcome. 
I, I wouldn't be here to tell the story. That's the difference. The only thing is, the only thing that saved me uh, in this situation is the fact that I had people not too far away and they got to me very, very quickly carrying white light. But if I was out there by myself um, and this thing was still standing over the top of me, as I said before, he hadn't finished with me, I, I wouldn't be here now. And this is what I'm saying. I attribute so many missing people in the forest to these things. Now, they have emotions, uh, if they're biological, uh, they have emotions just like any other animal or humans. They have good days, bad days. They, and there's good and bad and everything. It just makes sense. Now, you get all the uh, fairy floss do-gooder type people saying, oh, you know, they're just, they're just friendly people, uh, people, a friendly race uh, that mean no harm and they leave us alone, we leave their, them alone. It's not the case. That is not the case at all, you know. Uh, not from my experience. I've only met one good one or had uh, experiences with one good one. The rest of them you know, haven't been... <laughs> Haven't been so humble. Well, they, they, they couldn't be that. They can't be that aggressive, or there'd be a lot more people disappearing. I think. Yeah, but there is. That's the thing. And when I looked into the missing people, I was told by the bureau that the majority of people that is still not found are bush related, forest related. Yeah, you know Dave Paulides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he's been down there in Australia and stuff. But anyways, he's a buddy of mine. He thinks he thinks that of all the books and stories and movies he's done. He says, in hindsight, now I think it's way less than 5% are actually attributable to, to a Bigfoot. Oh, no, I'm not saying all of them are. I'm saying that some of them are. A lot of people uh, are. And, you know, again, I'm one of these people that was you know, one of the fortunate few. You know, one, one thing out of you know, all, all these years of doing this, Bobo, as I'm sure you'll agree, the more you learn, the less you know. When you began this, you used to be an expert but you aren't anymore. Exactly. Yeah, the more you learn, the more questions you get. That's how this field works, undoubtedly. You know, I was going to ask you, too, when we were down there, I guess, whatever that was, 2012, I guess, somewhere around there, four years previously, so it was 2008 or 2007, northern New South Wales, uh, kind of, it's like a hippie spot. Byron Bay. Yeah, Byron Bay. There's an Aboriginal reserve behind there, and we talked to several people that I'd seen one, a dead yai that was there for three days that washed up behind Byron Bay, a few miles back up river on the reserve, on the inland side of the highway, and they didn't touch it for a couple of days. And finally they said some government officials came and took it away. Did you ever hear about I, I talked to I talked to really great witnesses that said, yeah, it was there for a couple of days. It was at a bend in the river, it washed up. It had been in the water for a couple of weeks. It was rotting, and but it was there, and... and no one took pictures of it. I mean, nothing. It just, the Aboriginals just didn't want anything to do with it. And then some government guys came and hauled it off. Yeah, I know the story well. Um, I was contacted by uh, the grandson of the witnesses. Uh, it was an older couple. Uh, the story about that was that the couple were going for a morning walk and they'd come across this bridge, which is in the forest. It was just like a, it was just to get from one side to the other and just below was a river. Uh, this thing came from the other side, and they both parties were startled by each other, and this thing had jumped off the side of the bridge, landed uh, beside the water. Uh, the gentleman had walked down there to see if it was okay, not sure of what had just jumped off the bridge. When he got down close to it, he thought it may have been a bear. Of course, Australia doesn't have bears. Uh, he grabbed a big stick. It was face down at the time. He, he'd rolled it over. He said it was the most hideous-looking face you've ever seen. So he's gone to the authorities, as they do, and I've got a lot of stories like this. Uh, go to the authorities, and they come, they cordon off the area, they take the body away. Now, he's gone back into the local police station and inquired what's what's become of this, what was the outcome. And they basically said, of what? What are you talking about? Yeah, how, how many stories have you had of bodies that you believe are true? Like a couple dozen or? Oh, no, not that many. Uh, probably about a dozen. And it all has the same outcome. It, it always goes back to 
it's just the wrong decision. You don't go to the police. But I guess if you're not in the know, you, you wouldn't consider that. I mean, that's probably the first port of call people have is you, know, you go to the police and you report it. So what's been happening is the local police station, they make their inquiries, the who do we talk to, and it goes down to the federal building in Sydney. Then the feds get involved and their people from their black hole, which is what we call it, their black hole, they come out, they cordon off the area, the place is sanitised and um, they're suddenly in total denial. Oh, my God, I've got some great stories along those lines. What's the closest you think that it came to, like, where it wasn't, like, just the government swooped in and got it, like, where – because there's always cases up here where I'm, like, kicking myself. I'm, like, we were so close to getting a body recovered. Like, was there one case that sticks out to you where, like, you're, like, we could have – we were the – it was right at our fingertips. Yeah, it's about two years ago, two or three years ago, I get a phone call from an older couple – He's an ex-truck driver. They're, they're both retired. They had a caravan and they're going through or towards a, a place called Coffs Harbour, which is just uh, below Byron Bay. That's a hot spot. I know that spot. Yeah, yeah, it certainly is. And it was wet and it was windy and it was night time, towing the caravan, and here in front of them in the headlights is a gorilla lying on the ground, on the road, on the side of the road, a gorilla just lying there in a fetal position. They both saw it. They both had a very, very good look at it. There's no chance on that particular road, the road the way that it is, that they could have turned that caravan around and gone back And in that weather and them being that age. Uh, it disturbed them and they said it was huge. Covered in hair, you know. I don't need to explain what a bigfoot looks <laughs> what a bigfoot looks like. Anyway, it was it was on the ground in a fetal position, and they said it was enormous. So they've passed it. They phoned me and said it's there, it's there. Uh, so I've then called my contacts in Coffs Harbour. They went out straight away and said the body is gone. We're not entirely sure exactly where it was. It looked like there might have been. Uh, it's some drag marks and this and that, but because the weather was so inclement, they couldn't pick anything up for DNA or anything, but it was gone. So this is where, again, I return to where this one is another not too far away. One or two things happened. It's either it was knocked out and it woke itself up and walked off, or the one that's not too far away came and got him. Now, this guy being an ex-truck driver, he said, this thing was so big, he said, if that was hit by a car, there would have been debris. He said, but no. He said, what I think, he said, I think he's been clipped by a truck. And the, he said, the truck driver probably didn't even know. Wow. Yeah, you hear those stories fairly regularly. It's like, God, just so close. And people always call the wrong person. You know, they call the fishing game or the police or, you know, some authority figure that has no interest in making the thing public. Well, I'll figure it out. I'll, I'll let you know when I figured it all out, Dean. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, I'm relying on you. <laughs> oh, we're all in trouble now. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, cool, Dean. I really appreciate you coming on and straightening us out about what's going on down in Australia. Yeah, well, we, we should uh, keep in contact more often. Yeah, for sure. Okay, folks. Well, that was Dean Harrison from Australia and Yowie Research at yowiehunters.com. Check out his site. It's awesome. You'll, you'll be surprised how much evidence they have down there. It's it's a great spot to get the info, info on the Yowie. So, Dean, thanks again for coming on board. We appreciate it. Let's do it again. All right, for sure. All right, folks. Well, thanks for tuning in. Until next week, keep it squatchy. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Bigfoot and Beyond. If you liked what you heard, please rate and review us on iTunes. Subscribe to Bigfoot and Beyond wherever you get your podcasts and follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Bigfoot and Beyond Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at Bigfoot and Beyond, that's an N in the middle, and tweet us your thoughts and questions with the hashtag Bigfoot and Beyond. 